record on this computer. Oh, we're rolling. Okay, okay. I'm back. Uh, so I'm back in plenary session, video edition, joined by Dr. Paul Sachs. Paul Sachs should need no introduction to this audience. He is a legend in the infectious disease community. He is currently clinical director of ID at the Brigham. He's a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. And I guess I want to say one thing. You know, when I uh, was telling some people, um, you know, some mutual colleagues that I was going to have you on this podcast, uh, they said uh, there is no one other than Paul Sachs who is universally beloved in the field of ID. Um, mm-hmm. And so uh, I think that's high praise. So Dr. Sachs, it's a pleasure to have you on. Thanks for that nice introduction. I, I, I don't know that it's true, but it's so nice to hear. Well, you're known, you're known for being a nice person. And so, and so today we're going to put an end to that, that rumor. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to show the other side of Paul Sachs. Um, but yeah, you're known for being a really uh, a consummate professional, very nice person. And so, yeah, this person spoke very highly of you. Um, so thank you for doing this. Um, I, I wanted to talk to you about, you know, so many things, um, you know, all this last year has been, uh, it's been a, it's been a banner year for ID. Now you finally got ID. You wanted them on the map and you got it. You got it. We now all know about you ID doctors. Um, I don't know where to get started. I wonder if we should get started with today's big news, um, the CDC and the outdoor mask mandate. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a follower of your, of your column, uh, for, uh, on the NEJM website. And I would say uh, that these days it's fashionable to say that, you know, I will, I will always I knew that outdoor masks weren't that good. It's fashionable to say that, but you actually wrote about it. Uh, so I wonder if you might take us back to the spring of 2020. Um, what were your thoughts on outdoor masks then? Um, and how do you think about today's decision? What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, we, you know, it was really in the spring of 2020, we were trying to kind of show we were all part of team mask. And that, that meant that you wore a mask outside, even though, Really, even then, the data that you needed to wear a mask outside was very limited. And I remember once, actually, I ran afoul of some some followers on Twitter because I wrote that the WHO said you don't have to wear a mask while exercising outside. Yeah. And I said, I agree with this 100%. It might have been over the summer, and I got attacked. And I realized that this is really a hot-button issue for a lot of people. And, and anyway, I'm glad to hear that now we have enough confidence to say that people who are vaccinated don't need to wear a mask outside. <laughs> it, was hard, it was hard for 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 us to say that, but now we can say it, and I think that's that makes sense. I mean, I really, I really, it, the absurdity of having to wear a mask while walking by yourself outside is something that I see in Boston all the time, and I think it's actually going to be very difficult emotionally for people to get used to seeing people without masks. I'm sure the same is true in the Bay Area. Yeah, I think I think you're right. I mean, we're both in places where the uptake was high. Uh, you know, that's terrific in some settings, but certainly in the outside setting, uh, it's it's a question mark. Um, and, you know, I mean, if you want to unpack that a little bit, I mean, what, what were the things about the outdoor setting that, that gave you pause? I mean, obviously, uh, I would say the, the lack of any outdoor data would be, I mean, one thing, you know, okay. So, <laughs> you know, yeah. the, so, so um, after they opened up about their problem in China, they did some really impressive epidemiologic work to try to figure out how this virus was spread. Mm -hmm. And then also some exceptional work out of Singapore uh, and other Asian countries showed that really these outdoor spreader events weren't happening. So so everyone was so terrified of a super spreader event Mm -hmm. and there would be these large gatherings and they would not happen outside. They would only happen inside. And there was one incredible study that showed when, I think it was from Korea, where it showed that people who who took a bus to get to this religious event mm-hmm. um, actually ended up getting COVID, but the people who didn't, uh, didn't get COVID and because it was outdoors and really mm-hmm. it was all related to that bus travel. It wasn't related at all to the, the, uh, the religious event. And so, you know, the data were very strong right from the start that outdoor transmission was uncommon. I, yeah. I you know, and yet uh, there was on the contrary side, there were people who really clung to the idea that indoors it had to be droplets and that if you weren't like really close to somebody, right, right, right. then you couldn't get it. And and those people who dug their heels in about that, I think probably feel pretty bad too. So, you know, kind of a lot, a lot of, a lot of over assumptions without data. Yeah, but I, I mean, I think that's the strongest evidence, and that's why I always tell people you have to walk on your pilgrimage. You know, when you go to the religious, <laughs> yeah, you have to walk. Uh, you don't want to take the bus, especially if it's yeah. not if it's not re, if it's uh, stagnant air in there. Um, oh, totally. Yeah, you know, and the indoor dining. I mean, the other thing that was so absurd is that you had this situation in Boston where you would have people get out of their cars. They'd be driving in their cars without a mask with their partner. 
They'd get out of their cars, they'd put their masks on and walk to the restaurant and then enter the restaurant and take their masks off and dine indoors. Because <laughs> yes. indoor dining was now allowed. And it was like, what? That makes no sense at all. So anyway, uh, yeah. That's, yeah, yeah. That's like when I sit around my living room with my oven mitts on and I go take the casserole out, take them right off. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Makes no sense, um, but you know it does serve these sort of other sort of social functions. Um, it does, yeah. So, uh, so I, I, you know, I, I, I think that that's that's an interesting thing, and um, and uh, well, I'm glad that they finally come around. And I think you're right that it'll be a little while for everyone to get on board. And I think different people are in different degrees of sort of concern, personal concern, especially after vaccination. Um, the other ish interesting thing you wrote about, and uh, you know, some, uh, and and you scooped me because we submitted some article on this, and uh, you said all the things that we wanted to say, but better, but short, but more succinctly, um, uh, the J and J vaccine, mm. uh, the J and J vaccine. And so, I guess what I wanted to ask you about the J and J vaccine is, um, you know, um, I don't know, I've been blabbing my opinion around it. Um, uh, you know, I guess. Um, when we first heard about the pause, uh, you know, we knew something like there were six cases and the denominator was thought to be something like 7 million. And so people kept saying quickly, less than one in a million. Yeah. And, 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 and I always, I mean, I, I put a pause, I put a pause right there and I said, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if it's one order of magnitude more frequent because, mm -hmm. you know, we know with these kinds of safety signals that um, there are a lot of people who've experienced the event. They haven't even thought in their mind to attribute it to the vaccine. They may not have even reported it in any sort of reporting system. Um, the denominator we know, because that's the static thing. Um, but what we don't know is how much of the denominator is within the uh, vulnerable or perhaps particularly mm -hmm. vulnerable subgroup, uh, the age and gender subgroup. So that denominator might compress and the numerator might go up. And so order of magnitude, maybe will will pop up one. And it turned out, you know, with, with one week pause, that's exactly what happened that yeah. we are now, uh, you know, between 30 and 39, they're saying one in 84,000 ish. Um, but, um, you know, certainly women between 18 and 50, uh, you know, maybe one in 150,000 in that broader group. Um, yeah. I mean, one, one thing that I'm going to credit, uh, I hate, I hate to say this because it's unfashionable to say there's anything good about Twitter, but <laughs> you know, I I did I did not know about you before oh, Twitter. I see. And and you know, pre sorry to <laughs> yeah no. So pre COVID, I realized there was somebody who was make critiquing the medical literature really astutely. And so I, following you on this issue turned out to be very helpful for me and in my writing because. No one has ever told me this, Paul. <laughs> no, you, I never, you, no one has ever said I enjoyed following you on Twitter. It's always, I'm always apologizing I mean, in person when I meet people. Yeah. Well, no, it's, okay. it's, it's, I mean, you're not afraid to say what you think, which is good. And you think carefully about what you write. Now, you're not, you, the, the thing is, I mean, you, you're also not afraid to offend people, which I, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you make choices. Yes, we all uh, make choices I, in this life. We have to lie where we fall. Yes, I know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah <laughs> well, so, you know, so I, yeah, I, I yeah. saw you write that, and actually, yeah. you made this. You made several excellent points. First, you took advantage of the fact that you're a hematologist oncologist. Apparently, and I finally put that to use, Paul. I've been bullshitting this whole time, but now finally, it's in my domain. <laughs> so you, you were able to say yeah. this is yeah. not the same thing yeah, as the DVTs that happen after a long jet trip or the, you know, oral contraceptive related DVD. This is a consumptive coagulopathy that is really dangerous yeah. and managing this thing is, is horrific. Uh, so so we, we, it's a really serious problem. So that's one. And second, you pointed out this important thing about the vulnerable population and that, and then also you, you said, look, this is the number of cases we know now. The numerator is only going to get bigger yeah. as they investigate more cases. And I don't know, you probably heard they're already this is a, you know, a couple more yeah. cases, even since yeah. Friday's uh, yeah. Friday's meeting. I've heard there's some un unadjudicated ones too. So the tab, yeah. tab may go up, yeah. Yeah, I, I hear that there's around 10. That's what I've heard, yeah. Yeah, and you know, then, yeah. then you know, if it's in that same age group, um, and, and you know, if, you, if we went back, if we just sort of went back to December, January, we'd say it's, it's worth the risk. Yes, of course. I think we would. Uh, yeah. Um, or but if we were now, in India right now, if we're in New Delhi right now, oh we'd say, goodness. sure, give it, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. But but I can't imagine anyone saying to a young woman or a young girl, even below the age of 50 or 60, this is the vaccine you should get. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's not a nice thing to say about this life-saving preventive intervention that it's not the right thing to get when we've been saying the best vaccine you get is the first one you're offered. Mm -hmm. But I think we're at that, I, I, I'd say we are at that point mm -hmm. in the United States. We're very lucky, very fortunate 
So I would say, you know, someone came to me and said, look, I have a chance to get the J&J &J vaccine, you know, next Thursday afternoon, and I'll be one and done. Won't that be great? And I'll, I, I would talk to them about the pluses and minuses. And if it were a younger woman, I would actually probably actively discourage them. And I don't know what you would you think. No, I'm with you there. Um, I, uh, I guess, um, you know, for me, for me, it was always, I mean, I guess I would say, I don't know, th th that when I heard about this, uh, this problem, I mean, obviously, I've taken care of a lot of people with CVT, and it's not a, it's not always a fun thing to take care of, because sometimes you anticoagulate them, and the clot propagates, of course, and mm -hmm. they get backflow issues, and then they hemorrhage in the brain. When they hemorrhage in the brain, of course, they are obviously having stroke-like symptoms and permanent neurologic deficits, but we often continue anticoagulation largely based on the theory that if we were to cease anticoagulation, you get worse backflow, worse pressure, more bleed. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, what empirical data do we have to do that? This is, in fact, you know, the best medical practice you'll find in all the hematology books and up to date. Um, but, you know, we have to admit there's no, there's no robust data that supports those choices, but it tells you, you know, how desperate it is. Um, in addition to that, I've taken care of HIT. Hit real hit where you actually have thrombosis, and you know not these, you know, some antibodies to was sent on somebody, and they may or may not have hit. You know, they have sepsis, but, and that's so it's not they call me hit. No, it's not that hit. It's sepsis. Okay, okay, but um, real hit, and when you have real hit, it is a it is a challenging. You know, it, it's the reason why hematologists say don't call it benign heme. Uh, call yeah. it because it's nothing benign about that. So that's challenging. And then you you know you're dosing our gatriban, which has you know a therapeutic window like landing a spacecraft back on Earth. <laughs> you know you bounce. You know you know that therapeutic. Window. I'll trust just, you on this one. Yeah, it's not a, it's not a pretty thing. Um, you got these two things together. Okay, yeah. uh, that's not good. And you're talking about somebody who you know how many years of life has you got on the table with an 18 year old, a 20 year old, oh, yeah. and yeah, a healthy right. person. Um, and in contrast, of course, COVID is a serious threat, but, you know, there've been some changes. One change I thought, you know, instantly was um, it's easy to go to these tables, these papers of what the mortality rate for somebody 20 to 29 is. Uh, mm -hmm. That doesn't reflect what it is right now. You know, right now, the mortality rate 20 to 29 in your hospital, um, now that you're better, now that you're, you guys aren't yeah. uh, finding hydroxychloroquine under the couch cushion. No, no. You know, now that you, you know, now that the medical practice is a little bit better, we're a little calmer um, and, and we're past the first wave. I think mortality rates are lower multiplied by the probability that the that the person will actually contract SARS-CoV-2, yeah. which is declining, which is yeah. declining. Um, and we don't know where it's going to be in a month or two months. Um, uh, but it looking terrific. I mean, I mean, knock on wood, you know. Um, yeah. And so the more and 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 then the more I sort of did it, and I did a lot of spreadsheet making and thinking. And I was like, you know, when you have a vaccine, you really want it to be in a different ballpark. You want the risks to be in a low ballpark and you want the benefits to be, you know, great ballpark. And now they're getting in the same ballpark and I don't like it in the same ballpark and that, yeah. and, and, and then the two alternatives and, you know, yeah, that's how I feel. Yeah. I mean, the two alternatives and, and, and the two alternatives are so good. That's the striking thing. I mean, people were already kind of apologetic about the J and J vaccine a little bit that the efficacy uh, in the clinical trial wasn't quite as high. And there were potential reasons. I mean, it was done at a different time and done in different locations, and it still prevented severe disease, but the efficacy was lower. I mean, yes. you cross-study comparisons, yes. all the caveats right. about that, but it was lower. So, you know, I, I, I anyway, all I can tell you is uh, I, I think this adenovirus vector vaccines have a role in yes. global control yes. of COVID-19. I, I really do. And, and they are easier to transport and store and everything. But this is a, a very important safety signal. I, I would say I'm impressed that our safety system picked yes. us up. Yeah, right. You know, I'm yeah. don't, it's don't, a testament. Don't, yeah. Yes. So, so you know, and, and the other thing I impressed me, and you tell, again, be interested in your opinion, is the uh, transparency of the discussion. Yes. So that the ACIP, they get together, they meet, all of the slides are available immediately for download and review. You can watch the thing on, on yeah. YouTube. Yeah, you know? no, you're right, yeah. So. I, think, I think it speaks to two things. I mean, people who think that there's some you know cabal that's trying to suppress <laughs> vaccine safety, they're factually wrong because even the slightest whiff of safety, we're willing to pause everything and have a big discussion about. Yeah. You know, so I think that's a testament to the system being Absolutely. robust. But I will no, say that the decision, I think, is a test is a, is a bad was a bad decision. And here's what I mean, I guess I would say, you know, I, I heard a lot of interesting arguments. One argument was that, you know, um, what we do in the US will have global ramifications. And of course, I'm sympathetic to that argument. Like, of course, that is the case. And of course, this vaccine is very important globally, particularly in places with uh, rapid spread. Uh, at the same time, 
you know, the role of our regulation is unfortunately not to, um, you know, be a, a, a hand on the back of the globe. I mean, it's unfortunately, for better or worse, the role of our regulation is to regulate our country and what's best for our citizens. Um, you know, and so I, although I'm sympathetic to that argument, I, it doesn't carry water for me um, because I think, I mean, I'm personally with you, which is certainly wouldn't advise anyone under the age of probably, I would maybe even say 55 or 60, you know, just yeah. to give a little bit of solution, uh, a woman under the age of 60 to get the J&J, &J, I wouldn't advise her. And and I kind of, um, I'm willing, I want to bounce an argument off you in a second, but I'm kind of, I, 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 I probably would have taken away the choice, uh, to be honest. Mm. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, so, so uh, it, the decision, the split decision 10 to four, the four apparently didn't vote for um, taking away the choice. <clears throat> It was really about the, I guess it was about the degree of warning or how the warning is, is issued. So I think, I don't think anyone Nobody has wanted to take away the choice. I know, yeah. except me. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll tell, you, I'll tell you why, I'll tell you why, Paul. Um, you know, I guess uh, this, is my, this is my thinking through um, and, 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 and I'm, I'm gonna write a column on this. So I, I'm glad I get to bounce it off an expert before I, before I commit pen to paper. Although uh, the video may be watched by lots of people. So I'm kind of, uh, it is what it is. Um, but my, my argument is, um, you know, I, I mean, I guess, uh, I don't know, what do I view as the role of regulation? I view the role of regulation is, is not to take away all autonomy. Of course, you have the right to do whatever you want with your body. It's to prevent you from making choices that are fundamentally not in your best interest. And I think here mm -hmm. the choice isn't J&J &J versus nothing. The choice no. is J&J &J versus Pfizer in X amount of time. Right. And, and, and given, I think, all those parameters we said, you know, it's a very ambiguous choice. Then I think about who is the woman who's going to still get J&J? &J? I think about this woman. This is not an average woman. There's two types of women. I mean, one is the woman who actually didn't hear any of this stuff. That, and that's not what you want. I mean, you want an informed woman getting this shot. If she, you know, somebody doing this now should at least be informed of this, you know, that there's, you know, this number may change. We don't know. There's this risk, um, CVT, VIT, whatever, the T TTS they call it. Um, yes. Whatever alphabet soup you want to call it. Um, you know, she has to be, uh, so the uninformed woman, I, I'm not happy with that outcome. Or the informed woman. Now, the informed woman that nonetheless, even after knowing this risk, chooses to get this vaccine, I think is not the average person. I think this is a person who has a commitment in their soul to vaccination as a good. Um, they're somebody who believes fervently in vaccination. They believe in the importance of vaccinating for myself and to protect others. I think they're that kind of person. I think they're the kind of person who takes SARS-CoV-2 very, very seriously. They're not the kind of person who's going to dinner parties with unvaccinated people, going to you know mic clubs or whatever. They're not go you know they're not going on vacation to Texas just to escape our California mask mandate. I think the woman who get who decl who go makes this choice is not the person at average risk. So those tables that Jansen presented, I think don't capture her. I think she's a person at below average risk. And so what I actually think you created a situation is um, the person that you're giving the choice to is the person with the most to lose and the least to gain. You know, I, I, uh, it's, it, obviously it's a speculative argument. Yeah, um, yeah, but, I, I, yeah. I didn't think about that group. <laughs> I, I thought it more about the, the people who say have low uh, medical literacy. Oh yes, yeah. Um, that they wouldn't know about the alternatives and wouldn't really also have the, the uh, you know forthrightness to challenge medical authority, and and come forward and say, wait a minute, I don't want this one. I want the other one that doesn't have this blood clot risk. And in some ways, that group is the group I'm worried about the most, Fair because enough, yeah. they they're vulnerable. And the, in medical systems, they actually need regulation. So um, I would hope that clinicians would make the right decision on their behalf, although it's very tricky. And I, I just, you know, we right now the vaccines, the supplies exceeds the demand. It's so exciting. You know, anyone can get vaccinated, uh, but maybe there should just be a tweak of, of about which vaccine we're using. Um, and we'll see what happens. I think as more cases inevitably come to light yes. that we might readdress this. And plus there was another vaccine coming. You probably might, you probably yes. have all heard, you know, there's Novavax has a adjuvanted protein vaccine. That's very much like, for example, the shingles vaccine. Uh, I don't think they've seen any signal like this in that vaccine as that comes along. You know, mm -hmm. the question is how many COVID-19 vaccines do we need? Well, we'll, we'll see. It's, it's a very interesting question. It's also interesting that the, you know, these, huge, these companies invested a huge amount of effort to develop the vaccines. Hooray, they succeeded. But it, now at some point, some of them are, are actually probably not going to, are not going to 
well, maybe who knows? Maybe the government paid them off already. So they yeah, were, no, I, I, yeah, yeah, no, I, I think they're going to make their money, but the question is whether or not they'll ever be used. Yeah, I think yes. the government has as committed to buying their product. Correct. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I know I think you're right. I mean, I do. Um, um, as more vaccines become available, that that the, the the need for a younger woman to take this will diminish. And then the other th the other possibility is as if there are a few more cases that occur in men or something in these other bounds, then I think there's going to be some more discussion to be had. But yeah. I think, you know, yeah. my, my, I don't know. Tell me if you think, I mean, the, the pathophysiology I heard that was the most plausible to me mm -hmm. was unlike other adenoviral vector vaccines, the, the DNA load here is actually substantive DNA mm -hmm. load. Uh, okay, tell me if I'm wrong. And, and because it's a substantive DNA load, there is inevitably some extracellular escape of the DNA. DNA has a certain charge. When it bumps into PF4, it changes the polarity of PF4, which is thought to be the, the implicated mechanism in HIT. Well, I, you know, it's a good speculation. Uh -huh, um, yes. You know, I'm, I'm since I'm not a translational virologist, I can't tell you whether it's true or not. I know that that this has not been reported yet from the um, Ebola virus vaccine. And what about I, and that has a lot of DNA in it? Uh, I don't I don't know okay. the compromise. I know it's it's and then the other thing is that there's a, a the, the most advanced phase three study now in HIV vaccines is an adenovirus vaccine. Uh, there's a study called Mosaico, which is ongoing globally right now using the J and J vaccine structure, you know, uh, construct. And, you know, we're all kind of watching this study very carefully in infectious disease because we haven't done so well with HIV vaccines. <laughs> you know, we've, we've tried many, many times. In fact, the most recent. Um, yeah. Study was a total failure. I mean, the the overlying incidence curves you could not have drawn them more perfectly. So didn't really didn't one of those studies actually was was transmission higher in the vaccinated group in one? So, so <laughs> this is one of those terrible yeah. things in the history of HIV medicine is that in one actually in the adenovirus vector vaccine um, in people who were at high risk that particular adenovirus appeared to cause immune activation and immune activation can increase your risk of getting HIV. So in that particular study, there was an increased risk of getting HIV among the vaccinated group, which was completely unexpected uh, and, and has fortunately not been seen yet in any other, uh, in any other vaccine study. So yeah, you know, yes, that did happen. I yeah. see, yeah. Well, That's I why you do clinical remember. trials. I vaguely yeah. remember that was back yeah. in the day when when I see an ID paper, I would just skim the abstract and I'd flip the page. <laughs> now, now I can't do that anymore. <laughs> um, no, I know. So, so what? What's? Yeah, I mean, I I think it's uh, it, it 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 kind of remains to be seen what happens to all of this vaccine activity and how it spills over into other disease areas. I know mm -hmm. that you know vaccines for oncology are a big deal potentially. Yes, no, I don't. That. Yeah, no, no. It's been a very a hot area for a long time, uh, mm -hmm. and I, I'm happy to tell you about that in a second. But I guess the thing I want to draw is this trial about HIV vaccine and our experience with hydroxychloroquine. <laughs> I think there's a theme there, and the theme there is. This is why we do phase three studies. Oh, I totally. Um, and this is often why not just we do the phase three studies, but some of us wait for the results before we jump in. You know, um, because actually, in a pool, the meta analytic estimate I'm reading in Nature Communications, um, uh, hydroxychloroquine is not just implicated for with being an, with an inert drug. Uh, actually, they're reporting that there is a death signal that it's a trend mm -hmm. towards increased mortality. Um, you know, I, I don't know that that will be the final shakeout of it, but um, you know, and then this other study you described was a study where there was an increased uh, uh, uptake of the virus if you were to be vaccinated. Um, yeah. So, so there's actually a, an editorial in the Lancet or Lancet ID or one of the Lancet spinoffs um, of a very well-known HIV prevention research uh, person, Connie, Connie Sellen. Uh, she wrote an editorial saying we have to be careful with these adenovirus COVID vaccines because if you're giving them to people at high risk for HIV, you might actually increase their risk of getting HIV, which I think is a mm. theoretical concern, but it did come up in that, in that study. Oh, interesting. So, yeah. So I didn't know that about, about hydroxychloroquine. I do know that um, one of the one of the better hydroxychloroquine studies, which I thought was a fascinating study, which was done in outpatients remotely, uh, you know, early on in the pandemic, it was amazing. David Bulwar, uh, yeah, David Bulwar, was okay. amazing that he was able to carry that study off. It didn't show anything, but what he did show was that it was at least safe in that population. But, Correct. You know. Yes, and this was the um, this was the uh, uh, exposure. Pro it was a pro prophylaxic study. Yeah. And it was actually both. So oh, he did a prophylaxis right. study and a treatment study. Okay. And his treatment study was criticized on the basis of the fact that he had a lot of patients who were treated empirically. But remember yeah. what testing was like. Yeah. You know, a lot of people yeah. couldn't get tested. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you know, he that. couldn't, yeah. it was, oh, it was, it was a nightmare.
Oh. Yeah, no, I think it was. Yeah, and uh, his study was was a, was a was a contribution, and I don't. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Both studies, both the prevention one and the treatment one, both were were negative, completely negative. Most of the hydroxychloroquine studies that were well done were negative. Yes, but it's funny. Some some of the randomized clinical trials that were well done but small have been positive, which is yes. another kind of interesting thing. We'll see what happens with those when the fully powered studies come up. So you know, if you would do a well done small clinical trial that shows a favorable result. It could either be real yes. or it could be just chance that a few, yes. you know, so. <laughs> well, you know, this is actually a very interesting <clears throat> issue, um, which is that these, you know, underpowered phase two studies, randomized phase two studies, um, of course, they're notorious for the false negative rate, which is that, you know, there was a signal, <laughs> yeah. you missed it, but they're also notorious that when there are differences that are statistically nominally significant, those differences are either spurious or exaggerated much more often than an adequately powered study. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you know this little bit of history, but you know when Gottlieb was commissioner of the FDA, you know we mm -hmm. have the accelerated approval pathway, and that's mm -hmm. for things that have a statistically persuasive effect on a clinical or on a surrogate endpoint. Huh. So the effect is persuasive, no doubt, but the endpoint isn't what you cared about. It's the A1C, it's the tumor size. Yeah, Gottlieb, under pressure from uh, a, a sort of a advocacy group called Friends of Cancer Research, they made a one-time exception for a drug that had a um, it, 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 the effect was on overall survival in a small underpowered phase two. It was not statistically persuasive. I mean, it wasn't designed or powered for this, but they happened to find a whopper of an OS benefit. So they used the accelerated approval pathway for the first time for a drug for a clinical endpoint, survival, in an underpowered phase two study. And then the phase three was launched. And then the phase three reported about a year and a half later, after the company made 700, 600, 700 million dollars, Absolutely negative, superimposable curves, which really kind of speaks to your point that you know you can't always hang your hat on an under. No, to. no, actually, you know, I'm I'm very uh, interested to see there's this drug called fluvoxamine. Yes, I'm curious too. Yeah. Yes, you know, the fluvoxamine clinical trial done in a small number of people was had was a very well done study, uh, but it was small, and so uh, will it actually work? Uh, and fortunately, there are two decent sized phase three studies that would that are going to tell us. I'm looking forward to seeing those results. So. When you look at the landscape of the therapeutics in in COVID, um, you know, are where what do you think about where where are you utilizing remdesivir, polyclonal yeah. antibody, dex? So, yeah. So you know, I, I'm going to say that remdesivir. Um, you know, we're all biased by our own experiences, and I just want to say that up front. And uh, a very brilliant, energetic clinical researcher at our hospital. Unfortunately, he just passed away named Francisco Marty. Oh, yes. uh, he enrolled hundreds and hundreds of people into remdesivir studies early on in the, in the pandemic. And it seemed to us that it was working. And then right across town, they were doing the randomized double blind study, yeah. which did show a statistically significant faster time to recovery. And, you know, the endpoints were real and they were, you know, protocol to find endpoints. This is the NIAD well, study. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. So I actually believe yeah. that remdesivir works when it's given early. And if you look at the at the baseline characteristics, it shows that if you are starting treatment within six days of onset of symptoms, then you're more likely to get a beneficial effect. And you know, those those are those are important subcategories. So even though the recovery, you know, I'm sorry, the solidarities trial from the WHO was negative. The heterogeneity of that population was so giant. And the other thing is that in that early phase of the study, so many people were told, stay at home, stay at home. There's nothing we can offer you that when they finally got hospitalized, they often had had symptoms for seven to 10 or days or longer. And, you know, antivirals don't work in, mm -hmm. you know, when they're started late. So I, I am an advocate for remdesivir. I, I don't think it's you know, a panacea by any stretch of the imagination. Um, it has not saved as many lives as dexamethasone, uh, which has, which was transformative. That's a clinical trial that transformed practice like that. I mean, yeah. it was unbelievable. And well, actually maybe not as fast as you would have liked. I remember. Yeah, you, I don't know if you remember, I got in a big fight about that. Yeah, I would have changed the day, the day that press release dropped, I was gonna change because I had read the statistical, anyway, we'll talk about, I'll, I'll grind my ax in a second, but go on okay. remdesivir. So you give remdesivir, hospitalized patient, yeah. Um, every hospitalized patient, or do you want them to have had symptoms within a time, tier, time period? Yeah. So, so we give it to all hospitalized patients, okay. and you know, most of the people who get hospitalized now, uh, they haven't actually been symptomatic for very long. A lot of them have comorbidities, um, but they're they're bad enough to be in the hospital. 
you know, so they, they have other diagnoses that carry bad prognoses there. You know, they got cancer, they got heart disease, they got all the rest of the stuff. If they weren't sick enough from COVID, then they wouldn't be in the hospital. And so, I, I mean, and the other thing is you don't, we don't want to be in a situation with a drug that actually had a benefit in a phase three double blind trial of waiting until they get sick. Right. Yeah. You know, I, I think that is, that's the wrong approach. So the ideal remdesivir patient, I mean, I'm going to give you an anecdote. I'm no, sorry no, no. for the clinical anecdote, but there was a, a very, in the, in the second surge, a very sick 45 year old professional who got COVID, who had had fever of 104, 105 Fahrenheit for two days, cough, multi-system symptoms, you know, but, but, you know, oxygen saturation on the low end of normal, you know, but otherwise very healthy, but her symptoms were just a few days long. And I was, you know, I remember people saying, well, how do you know that remdesivir improves outcome in this case? Well, do you want to wait <laughs> until she kind of like gets much worse? That yeah, made no yeah. sense. Anyway, so, so, so yeah, we, we give remdesivir. It, it doesn't, it doesn't do anything once people are on the, in, you know, deep in the, disease and on, you know, then it's, then it's, it's bad. But anyway, dexamethasone is, was really critical for, for those critically ill patients Un for people needing oxygen who were in that inflammatory phase, however you want to define it. It, yes. it was, it was great to have that clinical trial. That was a major, major advance. Yeah. So, I mean, what I loved about it was, <clears throat> you know, the, the statistical plan was available. The protocol was available. You knew the subgroups they're going to look at. Yeah. Um, you knew the sample size is, you know, three grand plus. I mean, you got a huge sample size. Um, uh, you know, when we're publishing, you know, New England Journal papers with 100 people, you know, you know, so they're you know, coming with they're coming with a real sample size. Um, you know, um, you know, there are a number of pre-specified subgroups, but they but they they can, they told a story. I mean, the in, uh, so one, of course, the interaction between, um, you know, if you were hospitalized but didn't need O2, you appeared right. not to benefit. If you're hospitalized yeah. and need O2, you benefit some. And if you're hospitalized and mechanically intubated, you benefited even more. Um, and that interaction coefficient was like less than 0.01. Um, mm -hmm. That was a pre-specified subgroup. And that told the story that in this later consolidative phase, it's doing something. And I think the same thing from the number of days of symptoms they had had prior to admission, um, uh, there also was a signal there, if I recall correctly. Um, it was monumental, probably yeah. one of the crowning that and making the vaccine. I think you know these kinds of yeah, yeah, totally. No, I mean I and and the uh, the fact that it was the the fact that it came out as a press release caused a form of snobbery among us academics. Did you notice that? Oh yes, I noticed. Yeah. Okay, so so it's like press release. Don't have the paper, therefore not practice changing. Yes. But that those things don't necessarily make sense. No. Sometimes a press release is practice changing. And actually, I'm old enough to remember this. I remember when the first study showing that giving uh, treatment to pregnant women prevented transmission of HIV yes, to their babies. Uh, uh, uh -huh. mm -hmm. That was a press release. Yes. You know, it's like, and I remember that the, that 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 practice changed like this. Yes. I mean, it went from being don't give this poisonous drug to a yes. pregnant mom to Every pregnant woman needs to be on this treatment. This must have been and, 89, 90 New England Journal paper, right? The AZ yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It was, it was, it was, I'm really dating myself. It was actually early, early 90s. Early 90s, okay. Early 90s, yeah. But so, so it, was, it was like, but, but before the paper was published, we knew the result because it was so transformative and the study was stopped early. Um, you know, we had the same in, in cancer. There was an early study of adjuvant chemotherapy actually could cure an increased fraction of women after surgery with breast cancer. And I believe that was uh -huh. press. That was, you know, I, I forget the story, but there's something like they found a way to mail every oncologist this information. Like they thought it was so important. Um, you call it snobbery. I have I have a different theory as to what's going on. And I don't know if you like my theory. My theory is this. Um, you know, obviously there is a culture of medicine by press release. And what do we mean by that? It's a culture where you don't have a protocol, you don't have a statistical plan, you have a for-profit company that yeah. press releases a snippet of the most favorable information, not for anyone's benefit other than the SEC. Um, you know, they're really doing it to prevent insider trading allegations. So they want to yeah. get that out there so they can wash their hands of insider trading. Um, that is what we've all seen over and over again. And I think a lot of people enter this, um, you know, 
with different amounts of time in their own career, they have spent thinking about medical evidence and decision-making. Um, and if you didn't spend a lot of time and you just heard this medicine by press release is bad, is bad, is bad. When you get recovery medicine by press release, you say, that's bad, that's bad, that's bad. Of course, it's not the same thing at all. It's not a for-profit company. They're not selling you anything. This is dexamethasone. They're not making a dime off this. They're doing this in a pandemic situation. They publish their statistical plan. Everything is pre-specified. It's all in tip-top order. You know, um, uh, Marty Landre is a well-known guy. He's, he's at top of his game. Uh, it's not the same thing. It's the kind of thing you act upon immediately. And um, yeah. No, it was, it was, uh, you know, it was fast because we had, we had these conference calls uh, about how to manage COVID with, with international uh, clinicians because trying to, trying to figure out what did they learn that we could learn because, yes. you know, the pandemic hit first in China and then it, then it hit, you know, in, in, uh, in Europe. And so I remember one with the Italians and the Italians were saying to us, you know, we, we are, have started to use corticosteroids in all our critically ill patients. And we really believe that it, it works. And, you know, at the end of the conference, we, we, we kind of chatted about what, what to do with that information. And we basically ignored it, you know, uh, turns, out, uh -huh. turns out they were, they were, they, they were turned out to be right. I mean, wow. it was, it was yeah. before the, the, you know, the recovery study showed us any, anything like that definitively, but, but it was sort of funny. I'll never forget that. They were using it in all their critically ill patients before we were, because we were not doing that. We were giving way too much hydroxychloroquine though. Um, I think I, sh I shared with you the anecdote. I, 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 was, I was the uh, ID attending on two medical teams at the time that were both 100% COVID. And one of the medical teams, everybody on that team was on hydroxychloroquine. And the other medical team Hardly anyone was hydroxychloroquine, and I was the same ID consultant. So, you know, how did that happen in the same institution? You know, it was not part of our treatment guidelines, uh, and it was it was basically kind of the the power of a persuasive clinician or something. I mean, I, it was it was fa it was fascinating. It was a it was a randomized trial, but it wasn't randomized. <laughs> yeah, it was. Oh. Uh, yeah, it was a. No, you know, yeah. I mean, I'm sure you remember this from your residency. Yeah. I mean, there could be a very persuasive, yes. very articulate, very, mm -hmm. you know, charming, however you want to put it, yeah. clinician who says we have to do it, you know, and I can, I can actually, I, I understand the argument, you know, it's not that harmful. We, let's do something rather than nothing. Um, anyway, it's really, really. No, I think, yeah, th this type of person you describe, the charismatic clinical leader type, I think that one of the, one of the places that they insert themselves is, you know, we've had over the last 15, 20 years, we've had some health systems processes interventions, such as early goal directed therapy, such as yeah. tight glycemic control. Yeah. And these were both propelled on the back of single center randomization that showed astounding results. I mean, you saw that Manny Rivers study on early goal directed therapy, home run. You saw that um, Vandenberg study on tight glycemic control, home run. Um, when they were both extrapolated to multi center sites, absolutely nothing. And yeah. there are many possibilities of what actually happened. But one possibility is that there is something to the charismatic person at your institution. When a charismatic person inserts themselves in a health systems process, and they are saying, this is an intervention patient, and I'm going to check up on how you're running my protocol, you know, they're going to get good care. because You ain't <laughs> yeah. going to slack off because they you don't want them breathing down your neck. And, and that might be the effect that we're actually seeing in some of those studies. It could be. Interesting yeah. thought. I mean, it, 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 it brings to mind another interesting idea which comes from one of my uh, colleagues here in, in Boston at the Brigham, which is a surgical colleague, which is uh -huh. a Tugawandi and his yes, checklist. Yes, I remember. Yes. You know, I mean, he, it's a simple idea and I no doubt it, it does something. I, I don't know that it does something in all contexts, but it, it certainly took off. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think that's the greatest example. He is the, the, the most charismatic proponent and um, it took off. There are, there are some, you know, there's a quasi experimental study, which is frankly not that good. And then they did that cluster randomized trial. It was a New England Journal, uh, New England Journal, a Lancet paper, cluster randomized trial called the Surgery Saves Lives. I think New England Journal. Um, and it did, in fact, show surgery save lives. But I guess the challenge I had was like one of the components was like pr um, perioperative antibiotic administration and went yeah. in some sites from like 20% to like 100%. And okay. I was like, but 20%, that's like, that's just negligent. I mean, that's not, I was like, I, I want to know your checklist Terrible. saves lives beyond giving yeah. things that we know already saves lives. Um, yeah, no, that's a great example. So um, sur surgical prophylaxis, um, yeah. you know, ID doctors are, are kind of intrinsically uh, <clears throat> cautious about administering antibiotics. And we've been wrong about certain things. And you'll, 
probably take part in this because you're a Hemonk person and you Hemonk people use antibiotics like water. But, <laughs> yeah, we but do. Yes. Yeah. Before my time, there were ID doctors who said that surgical prophylaxis with antibiotics is a bad idea. No. Um, yeah. You know, I mean that that turned out to be an exceptionally good use of antibiotics. You know, one dose of antibiotics before surgery has prevented you know, untold numbers of surgical infections. It's just an amazingly effective intervention and it has very few downsides. Interestingly, the downsides come because surgeons want to extend the antibiotic length after the procedure. And that actually now we know does actually cause harm. But, but it's, a, it's interesting how we were just so, we're so conservative with our antibiotics, we wanna save them so much. But sometimes even when they're clearly effective, we don't want to use them. It's interesting. I mean, I think you're, I mean, but all these, all these little stories are kind of painting the picture of, um, you know, the practice of medicine at the bedside. Um, you so easily can feel as if you have found, um, you know, the magic bullet. Um, I'm sure the colleague of yours who is giving hydroxychloroquine felt in their heart that they are seeing it work. Um, and the Italian colleagues, they're seeing the corticosteroids work. Yeah. And, yeah. and the surgeon who wants to give the slug of antibiotics it feels that it works. And, you know, sometimes they're right. That's, yeah. that's the beauty of medicine. Sometimes you were right, but a lot of the times you were wrong. And the only way to separate the intuition from the truth is the study. Um, Definitely. So, so the, now the next thing, polyclonal antibody. How oh, my you, God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Trump cocktail. I mean, for Christ's sakes, this guy got chopper just to get it. Convalescent plasma? Or you're talking about the monoclonals? Monoclonals, the monoclonals, yeah. Okay. So the, the monoclonals, um, wow, uh, where do I start? Yes. They, 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 monoclonal antibodies are the darling of the, uh, of the scientists, and they just love them. And they're being extensively studied in HIV, which is my area of focus before. COVID. That's because you can patent them. Of course, you can patent this compound. It's the greatest thing ever. And and yet I'm going to tell you that that I after a lot of effort I don't see any use for monoclonal antibody treatments of any sort in HIV yet. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll be wrong. So then they, then COVID comes along and again there's this really nice hypothesis about how they're going to work, and they do work, but they work exactly where we kind of have the hardest time giving them. They work in outpatients who have very early disease, or they work in people who are unvaccinated and exposed to right. COVID. That's where they work. And giving an IV treatment to a person with a highly contagious infection is- Who's an outpatient. An outpatient. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is extremely challenging. Yes, okay. And you know, most infusion centers at medical, <laughs> medical centers are, are like for cancer chemotherapy or yeah. for to give, you know, biologics to immunocompromised patients who have rheumatologic disease or multiple sclerosis. And so setting this up in any kind of scalable way has been unbelievably difficult. And there is going to be a story to be told because some centers have done it. And actually in the ID literature starting to appear places where they've treated like a thousand people yes. with these monoclonal antibodies as outpatients. Yes. Yes. But I'll tell you that, that unfortunately, my medical center is not one of them. It was logistically just too difficult. Mine plus Mass General, the Brigham and MGH combined, and the number we could treat as outpatients is very, very small because of the problems that I mentioned. That's interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, inter yeah. So I get, I mean, um, I mean, can that, you imagine, like, if I went to Dana Farber and said, I'd like to bring in, you know, 10 co COVID patients during their peak of infectiousness yes, to your chemo yes, infusion unit. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's not going to go over well. Not going to go over well. Not since Troy <laughs> opened the gates uh, to the, 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 yeah, no. Um, yeah, I think it's not going to go over well. Um, it's an interesting thing. Yeah, I mean, I've heard of a few people who are giving it. Uh, they're working at places where uh, uh, they may have even more cash than your place. Um, but you're right. I mean, I think, I guess I hadn't thought about all that, but yeah, I mean, I would imagine that if you were a cancer patient getting your infusion, uh, which you need to get, um, you wouldn't be so happy if the next four bays are all COVID patients. Yeah. Yeah, no, it, it really, it worked best. I know someone who works down in, um, in, in Tennessee, an ID doctor, and they gave him, you know, like a, a, a section <clears throat> of either the emergency room or a treatment area that wasn't being used because COVID was raging. And so they, they downsized their, their ambulatory treatments. And so they, they said, you can have this. And he ended up treating hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. And I no doubt they actually benefit. I mean, the randomized clinical trials of these drugs, when they're, when these monoclonals, when they're given early, do show that they prevent disease progression. Um, 
if they're given late, they do nothing. Yes, right. Which yes. is which is the challenge. Yeah. And so I guess I mean, the people this, on on rituximab are probably the best people to get it right now because they they're ah, not going to respond point. to the vaccines. That's so. a good point. B cell depletion therapies. They have yes. they're not making antibodies themselves, so they are the ones who should be. That's a great point. Yeah. So I mean. Exactly. If one were to look at, I mean, I don't. I, when all is said and written, we will see how many different compounds were tried. I, I, I can think of at least a hundred, but perhaps there's a thousand or ten thousand. I don't know the answer. Um, of the, all the things that have been tried, I guess the the things that we have are we've got. I mean, in terms of randomized data that we believe is robust, we've got Dex, Remdesivir, and even before the um, the monoclonal antibodies. I call it polyclonal because isn't it four different antibodies in the the pool? Well, they're they're. The, com the companies have made monoclonals and they realized that that a single monoclonal, the one, the first one yeah. that came out, Bamla and Infamab, it's now, there's a lot of resistance to that one. I, I mean, that's one of the problems with monoclonals yes. is that the viruses don't have to change very much and they become resistant. Yeah. So, so there's a combination product uh, that is, and then there's another one that's, that's you know, there are a bunch of companies making them. They, they, you know, monoclonals are, are profitable. You have, you've got it right. Yeah. Um, so so I, th I, I, I think those, those will, stand the test of time and ultimately probably in vaccine, pe people who can't respond to vaccines, maybe that will be their treatment, but it's not what they originally anticipated. I don't think that yes. it would just be for this immunocompromised population. So what else uh, can I say is therapeutically, um, there's to the tocilizumab controversy. Yeah, um, let's talk about it, yeah. And tocilizumab, you know, it's like, it keeps getting knocked down in clinical trials and then keeps getting back up in clinical trials. And so the, the results are, are really all over the map. And that's because of the heterogeneity of the population that it's given to. In some of the studies it's given too early and people don't benefit. In some studies it's given too late and people don't benefit but it does appear for that group of patients who are like deteriorating on the floor about to go to the ICU or in the emergency room and about to get admitted to the ICU that tocilizumab added to dexamethasone improves outcomes it's a so very it, this is the genentech study this is the um the yeah yeah yes there was yeah. one other study uh, as well it was a european study but there were a lot of negative studies including solidarity right one of the arms of solidarity right? oh absolutely yeah. absolutely the so, problem with meta-analysis is solidarity is so big that it just pulls a whole meta-analytic weight yeah okay. correct but but you know that again the heterogeneity of the yes. patients in solidarity means that it's really hard to, to sort out and i do i do think there is this this sweet spot yes. for tocilizumab, but it's it's not everybody hospitalized with COVID. You know, it's not nearly as big as the dexamethasone group. In your perfect world, then it sounds like vaccines for everybody, except for we debate the J and J part. Um, if you if you get sick, we'll make an infusion center just for the um, the uh, the monoclonal. Um, you get into the hospital as you're entering. We'll give you the remdesivir. You're thinking about going to the unit. We give you the tossy, and then in the unit uh, or when you're on the O2, you get the dex. Yes, yes, actually, you you know the O. Since people going to the unit are going to be on oxygen, they're going to get Dex plus Tosi. Uh, of course, yeah. yes. Yeah. Okay. So there's another. There's you know baricitinib. But, you know I don't. You know it's just, well these drugs you know. That's a Jack two inhibitor. Yeah, yeah but exactly. it's a rheumatoid arthritis drug. I mean we have a different Jack two inhibitor that we charge a little bit more for. Okay. <laughs> we got the good one. We got the good Jack two inhibitors. But yeah. um, Baric I mean baricitinib does did not do yeah. any better than dexamethasone. So. Uh, people are kind of looking at that clinical trial. It was actually an NIH study, baricitinib versus dexamethasone, and there was essentially stopped early because there was going to be no benefit, and dexamethasone is so much cheaper. So. That's interesting. In Europe, they're testing things like dexamethasone, like tenofovir, and here we're testing things that are branded on patent. You know, it's got to be <laughs> with a. Um, but you know, um, I think it's interesting. Um, I didn't hear I didn't hear the names that I thought would be the first ones off your tongue, like um, vitamin D, ivermectin. Uh, yeah. oh, I like that. I actually think those are fascinating. And I was asked to give a talk recently uh -huh. to a group of, you know, like hun hundreds of primary care clinicians. That's what they want to know about. Yeah. You know, and and there, you know, you can go through ivermectin, vitamin D. Um, uh, I would mention fluvoxamine. Yes. Um, so the other drug, metformin. Um, metformin. <laughs> Atorvastatin. I mean, oh, all of these mm -hmm. are being tested as ways of reducing the risk of getting hospitalized in people with outpatient COVID-19. Because right now, we got nothing. I mean, yeah. except for the monoclonals, and it's hard to give those. Yeah. Uh, so, so I, I, I'm hopeful that one of these studies, Ocultrazine, oh, I mentioned that one. That's oh, actually yes. a de decent-sized study. And you want to talk about the opposite of the press release situation, um, <laughs> because 
you know, um, because it was that, um, what was it, the Montreal group? And they put out that press release that was like, and if you took every last colchazine, you wouldn't die at all, you know? And if, if actually, if you're, if you're still taking colchazine today, you didn't die. That's, <laughs> um, it, was a, it was a funny, yeah. it was a funny study though. It was, it was a randomized trial of yes, over, over 4,000 people. Yes. Huge. So, yeah. so, so the press release, it sounded like, wow, we're going to yeah. see some amazing data. And then yeah. in the uh, preprint, it was kind of like, hmm. Yeah, the primary yeah. endpoint didn't meet the primary endpoint, and I don't know. I, I, yeah. I, I, I actually, what was your what was your read of the the culture scene study? I all I I I, I, re I read it as a negative study um, okay. when I read the final preprint. But I guess um uh, when I read the press release, I actually did put the pause on it because there's, the way the press release was written was very squirrely. I mean, it 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 specified that in the primary endpoint there's a trend towards significance, but in a subgroup there was a benefit. So already you want to you know I don't know when you yeah, run I mean, a, it was, yeah. It was an interesting DSMB decision. I mean, they yes. stopped the study oh, yeah. early, which uh, usually you only do for kind of, you don't want to- Slam dunk harm. results, yeah. Yeah, slam dunk results where you don't want anyone to be harmed by being yeah. randomized to the wrong thing. I mean, that's at least how, when I'm on a DSMB, that's how kind of, I feel like that's my charge. You know, you look and you want to say, is there a safety issue that we have to stop the study early? Um, and I kind of didn't quite get there for the culture scene study. But anyway, one of one of these, you know, the, 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 the um, NIH is about to start a like six or seven drug treatment study for right. COVID-19 as outpatients. And, you know, it's looking at all repurposed drugs and, and it's got some good people who are in charge of the trial. So I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what they choose. I don't know what they're going to choose. I assume ivermectin will be in there. That actually triggers the most, right now it's the triggers the most heated response. In fact, yeah. just today, I got an email from someone uh, who was a friend, friend of mine, his Someone he knows from childhood uh, is desperately trying to get someone to prescribe him colchicine. And not, I'm sorry, ivermectin. ivermectin yeah. And, he can, and, yeah, and, he, and he can't find a doctor to prescribe it. But there are actually a lot of doctors prescribing it right oh, now, wow. and in particular in, in Latin America. And there's a fiercely ad, 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 advocacy group that they've made this their entire focus, uh, an American group of American doctors who have a website and everything who are touting the absolute uh, ironclad evidence that ivermectin is great. Um, but I think we'll have to see. I mean, a lot of the studies that have been done have been negative or they are in preprint form and you can't really tell what, what happened. <laughs> so, oh, fascinating. Yeah. 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 So, um, <clears throat> and that's an, probably another example of charisma driving treatments because I think, you know, both hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin, um, for some reason, they got a disproportionate amount of attention mm -hmm. than, you know, tenofovir, yeah. for instance, you know, uh, I mean, all the other kind of, yeah. Yeah, ten tenofovir disoproxyl fumarate, yes. which is oh, yeah. The, yeah, the old one, uh, which in Spain <laughs> and in South Africa seems to be doing something beneficial, but but uh, nobody's really interested in it because it's just sort of generic and old and, and may, it, may not, it may not work either, so... Uh, I do have one Spanish colleague in ID who thinks that it's worth still studying. So Interesting. We'll see. Yeah. Well, I'm a big supporter of studying any of these things in with with adequate coagulation. Yes. Yeah. You know, it's funny because I have a paper coming out, but it's it looks at cancer, but it's a similar kind of thing, which is that, um, you know, there's some questions in cancer where we have both randomized trials and we have these national clinical database, blah blah mm -hmm. blah, observational studies. Yep. And. I pooled all of these papers and I found that um, on average, the randomized trial uses about 1 15th the sample size of the observational study. It's just a product of the fact that if you're gonna study something observationally, people have to have done it for a bit. You know, They had to have done it for some time. Um, and it's typically 14 times as much as in the randomized study. Wow. And, this, and there's some discordance between the two. But then what I do in this is a, I do a simple thing because you know people always say like, one, what is one reason you don't do a randomized study? There are lots of reasons, but one reason they always say is cost. It's so expensive, so expensive, so expensive. Now I've, I've, in the first part of my paper, I proved to you that on if you did an observation, it'll be on average fifteen times sample size higher. That means, uh, you know, seven point five times as many people will get the treat the treatment. And then I make an analysis of the break even point. How much does a treatment have to cost before the trial is actually cheaper because fewer people have to get the treatment, right? Yeah. And the answer was in in this, it's uh, embargoed. Well, actually, but it, I don't think anyone. Yeah. Really care. Um, <laughs> the answer was it was like eight thousand dollars. Uh, for treatment course. If it's uh, less than $8,000 of treatment course, it's cheaper to do the observational study. If it's more than 8,000, it's cheaper to do the randomized study. And it turns out in oncology, every single thing we give is more than $8,000 a course. Oh my God, yeah. the costs of your treatments, wow. They hey, really- we gotta have that conference in <laughs> Maui. <laughs> what, what, what do you think is gonna happen in medical conferences? 
Uh, this is this is my question. Okay, I guess I'd say, um, I don't know. I'm curious what you think. Um, I guess my two cents are, um, I think that there's one aspect of the conference that um, you can just not replace, which is like, you know, you and I meet up at 3 p.m. and we go get a beer. You yeah. know, and and that right. is often the single best thing about the conference is we have a casual conversation. You know, um, three years later, we write a paper together. You know, those kinds of interesting yeah. things. And I think yeah. that that that's why people are going to want to go to conference. But all the other things, I think, are almost easier for me. Like going to the sessions instead of walking across <laughs> to here, I can watch the video at my leisure. Um, yeah. I actually encourage people, um, like students and trainees, if you make a video of you giving your slideshow to the conference. Uh, put just post it on YouTube too, and post it on yeah. Twitter so that like, cause I don't want to pay the fee, you know, to watch all the, yeah. you know, yeah. Um, so I think some of it will actually be changed dramatically. Yeah. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I do too. I, I, I agree. I mean, I, it's, it's that, that, that chance meeting is, is gone and that's a shame. Um, but the rest of it, hmm. Yeah, I know. It's really, it's a very interesting, I do, do the conferences are huge money makers, and, you know, I, I, I'm an infectious disease doctor. Uh, we are in the low end of all kinds of revenue scales <laughs> for salary and RVUs and you name it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the Infectious Disease Society of America, which is our professional society, makes most of its money from the These annual meeting. Yes, yes. You know, uh, and then to some extent the publications. But it's it's really, it's 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 fascinating. It's very very important. Um, I, I I don't know. I I have there there are there are still none on my calendar that are going to happen in person. I don't know about yours. Uh, they, no, I got nothing on my nothing on my calendar for now. Um, yeah. yeah, nothing scheduled. Although I'm eager. Yes. I, I'm I'm optimistic about December. You know what? Yeah. Um, I need to take a pause for one sure. minute. Uh, I'll oh, pause no, one problem. minute. You stay right there. Okay. All right, the pause is over. Um, but you know, you were just saying that you know, you're surprising. But I'll tell you something about listeners. I, you know, because I have a lot of aggregate data on listening. There's two types of people in the world. They're the people who are not that interested. They'll listen to five minutes and they're gonna, they're not gonna listen no matter what we say, no matter how great we are. And then there's other people who will listen if we talk for ten hours. I mean, there's, a, there's another cohort, and they'll just listen to the end. And you know, the meeting is the meeting is not the message, Paul. It's the tail. And so it's, yeah. it's, okay. um, <laughs> that's what we tell ourselves in my line of work. Um, so, so I mean, I, I, yeah. you know, I do, I, I talk to people also, you were kind enough to come on, on my podcast. I do it in a very, I'm, I guess I'm more of a control freak than you because I, because I, 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 I get scared, you know, so I, get, I gave you a series of questions to think about ahead of time. And I worry that people are going to stop finding us interesting. So uh, yours is um, terrific. Um, I don't know. There's just, uh, I guess I think there's, um, there, obviously, there's different there's different podcasts for different people. I mean, I listen to the New York Daily. I listen to the Daily at like two and a half times speed. And in fact, yeah. I once listened at one time speed, and I couldn't believe my how slow they talk. Um, you know, because I'm used to listening so fast. Um, that's one type of thing I listen to. But the other thing I listen to is I listen to some of these podcasts. I can't even tell you the names, Paul. Uh, but they they run from two to three to two two to three to four hours long. Wow. Um, and they I'll tell you why I really like them. Um, just as just the podcast talk. Um. I really like them because many of the guests are famous people, people that you and I have seen on TV many times. And famous people are very good at telling you their thoughts for 15 minutes. Mm. They do it all the time. But you take a famous person and you make them talk for three hours, they eventually have to talk the way they actually talk and they say what they actually think. And, and that's when the truth comes out in my uh, opinion. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I'm just going to say it does not surprise me that you listen to podcasts faster than originally recorded. <laughs> oh, I see, because I talk fast. Yeah, I know. But no one can, no one can record, no one can do that with your podcast. I, that's my point of pride. I don't want to <laughs> listen fast. Yeah. Um, I guess, uh, I, you know, I was talking to somebody about this recently. I do talk fast. And the reason is, if I don't talk fast, um, I, my own train of thought is interrupted by many other thoughts. Huh. It's a problem. Interesting. Have you always spoken fast? I think so. Yeah. yeah. Well. You know, it's, it, I, I, I just were, I, I actually going to tell you that the chief of medicine when I was a resident <laughs> was this, you know, legendary cardiologist named Eugene Brownwald. No, of course. And the thing about him that, that scared me was that he got bored so quickly when you talked to him. Really? <laughs> like, I could tell if I was talking to him or presenting a case or something that his, his, you know, he just like, his mind was on to the next thing. <laughs> <laughs> and the pressure of talking to him was was something but you're so. you're also a fast talker and you're also a good talker but um i tell people and this is such a this is a very controversial view i hold yeah. 
And I'm going to talk to you about some of the other things that we share, like paperwork. Um, the controversial view I hold is this. Um, trainees often tell me that there is an attending on service or, you know, um, that uh, doesn't pay attention, easily yeah. distracted, doesn't listen. I have to repeat myself. I already said that. And they you know, ask again. And what I say is that to some degree, it is their fault. I want to say it's their fault. They should have focused. They should put their phone away. They should try to minimize distractions. But to some degree, it's the way you talk. <laughs> and, and, and I hate to say this, but um, there is a way to ta talk to people, especially in medicine, speak to convey information. Um, you got to really know the points you want to hit about the patient. You got to know mm -hmm. that the person, they only got, you know, the, fir the first pass is I give like 30 seconds. I want to get to my key points. Then mm -hmm. I want to go for two minutes and talk a little bit about what's the data that supports it. And then I want to hammer home my thesis. Um, and so I think that people can improve their presentation yeah. skills. Yeah. Now there's almost, you know, when you when you go to look at films in the radiology lab, uh, you know, with radiologists, and then you have someone who's new to the whole process, and you say to them, you know, why don't you just tell the radiologist a couple of words about the case, and they start presenting the whole thing, and you realize the radiologist is like, I don't want to hear the whole thing. You don't want to know that. Yeah, one yeah. line. One line. One, one line. What's going on? Yeah, that's 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 the that's the way that's the way I think you you have to read the audience. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so here's what I wanted to ask you, Emily Oster. You okay, know, yeah, she's great. <laughs> I, I know. Yeah, she is great, um, but she doesn't get treated great. Um, um, you know, why do I like her so much? Um, you know, what do I like about people? I guess I would say, and I like this about you too, and I like this about several people, and, and I think you're probably the same way. Um, you know, I actually don't like people I agree with 100%. That's not what I'm looking for in life. What do I want another me for? You know, that's boring. I like people that I agree with 70%, 60%, 90%. Mm. I like people who, when they say what they think, I know they're not telling me what they think because they heard it. They're telling me what they think because they actually thought about it for a little bit of time, and this is what they think. Mm. Um, and and so that's part of why I, I like her a lot because, and, and they're not afraid to tell me yeah. that they think something that's not the mainstream view. And I think she's somebody who's a very disciplined and smart thinker about a few things. But one is, I think, low probability risk. Yeah. She's written a couple of books about parenting and parenting and pregnancy is nothing but low probability risk. The risk something bad happens to a kid, thank God, it's low probability. Um, how do you negotiate these choices? How do you make decisions when there are low po probability but not zero risks? And she has, I, I understand, but I've not, it's not my interest, but she has some slightly controversial views on that it's okay to have a glass of wine once a day when you're pregnant, which actually she'd probably write about, you know, because there are countries yeah. that do that. And the, the risk of the baby is probably, she's probably right about that too. I have not looked into it. Um, she has other sort of views that have provoked people who are yes. absolutists. Um, one of her recent views, actually many through COVID-19, I think have been refreshing. Um, but the one that I thought was really good um, was about the vacation. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. So what are your thoughts on this? Yeah. <laughs> she really we can talk about how, what she got into, but I guess the first thought, the question is, you know, um, imagine a theoretical couple, yep. 30, 40 year old parents, they've got young kids. Um, they want to go on vacation this summer. Can they go? Is it safe? They've been vaccinated. Parents have been vaccinated. Yep. They're 10 weeks out. What are your thoughts? So, I mean, I'm, I'm married to a very thoughtful and intelligent pediatrician <laughs> and she would say, absolutely. They can go. And I completely agree with that. I, I, I feel like, you know, kids, first of all, kids, one thing I know from being married to a pediatrician is that most kids, when they get COVID-19, it's very mild. I mean, that's a fact. <laughs> you know, it's, it's almost like, controversial to say, but it is a fact. Yes, it's very yeah, mild. I mean, yes. There might be exceptions, but in fact, you know, uh, in most flu seasons, she has sicker kids than her COVID-19 kids yeah. this year. So I know that we don't want to compare anything to the flu. It's it's bad habit in COVID-19, but I think it's appropriate in the pediatric yeah. literature. So anyway, so, so she would say absolutely. And I read that piece that she wrote and her, I think that the, the, what happened was she, she made a, an error, which I bet she wishes she could take back. And she said that, that, that the kids are like vaccinated adults. Right. Didn't she say make yes. that analogy? They're like a vaccinated grandmother. Yeah. Yeah. Like a vaccinated grandmother. And, and, so many people just they focused on that. Yeah. And then she did something I thought that was very smart, which is that she pulled back from interacting with her readers and disappeared for a few days yeah. and then came forward with, I think was a, a really brilliant and articulate apology for that particular statement. And, and then it seems to have died down. I'm sure she still has some enemies. Yes. Uh, 
it's easy to make enemies on Twitter. Yes, it is. <laughs> oh, yes, I know. I have a whole club of them. But yes, um, you, you yeah. Have, yeah, I mean, I, I have had, I don't like conflict. So I have tried to avoid that. But I did trigger some serious negative responses from my comments about the vaccines reducing the risk of disease transmission. Oh, I remember. Yeah. Yeah. And I had to stop looking at Twitter for about five days because I was getting so attacked that I essentially was not worth my time even to to look at it. Uh, To me, it was like biologically, this is by far the most likely scenario that these vaccines, in addition to reducing disease severity, also reduce the likelihood that they transmit the virus to others. But people could not accept that without primary evidence that was ironclad. We already had pretty good preliminary evidence right. and multiple other vaccines that do this. And right, and the Bayesian, not- right. The pretest probability was going to do is very high, especially very when you high. know that at least some of the transmission is by s- symptomatic infection and you've right. eliminated that, you know, so there's something going to be different. Yeah. So, so it was, it was like, and so I remember that there was one person who looked, I have to tell this anecdote because yes. it just still sticks out. We see this result results from either the Pfizer or the Moderna study. I can't remember what it was. It was nine. I remember the result was ninety five percent reduction in symptomatic illness and nearly one hundred percent reduction in severe illness. I think it was yeah. the Pfizer data. And then yeah. someone asked the question, "Did you check for reduction in asymptomatic infection?" <laughs> yeah, yeah. And someone put on Twitter that that was the most important question that was still unanswered in the vaccine studies. Gosh. And I thought. The most important question? (laughs) The most important question was the severe part, and that's been answered, yeah, and answered resoundingly. Resoundingly. Um, So so anyway, that that showed me that maybe this was going to be a a really controversial area, and so by commenting on it in a favorable way, I ended up getting attacked quite significantly, and that's not my, I don't like that one bit, so I pulled back, went away for a week. (laughs) I I guess... um, I, I can understand that. And I, I, yeah, I, that was an issue that set people off. Um, you're of course, were, you were, you were right then you're still right. And now you have many more data to point to point to that. Yeah. You're right. Um, it was obviously the case <laughs> that it would severely. And, you know, um, I don't know, I guess I thought that, you know, like to, to me, there was either two leaps of faith. I mean, I guess, you know, I wrote something very strong on this too, that after vaccination, yeah. especially to, you know, so many people, and, you know, we did have data, we had Moderna swabs on dose two. Right. And actually that was also at least 60, 60% reduction. Between the first yeah. dose. Yeah, yeah. Just from the first dose, right. just from exactly. the first dose. And it's going to get deeper. It's going to be more. Um, you don't even have maximal opsonizing antibodies in the mucosa yet. And it's going to get better and better. It's only going to get better. Um, and, and to me, there, there's two leaps of faith, of course. One leap of faith is somebody saying, well, you haven't proven for sure that it decreases transmission. I said, okay, I, yeah, I haven't proven for sure. But, but, but the flip side is, I was like, have you proven for sure that wearing that mask is still benefiting any, <laughs> like, get out of here. You're not pro- wearing that mask after you're vaccinated outdoors, you're proven for sure that that's the case? Because you're not, pro- I was like, just do, I don't know. Sometimes I think that people, we should train doctors to do um, power calculations. I'll tell you, you know, like on Stata. Like just the reason I think it's power calculations are so important is sometimes I'm arguing with somebody about what we should do. And they'll, and you know, the evidence is uncertain. And I, and I want to say like, just think about the effect size you're, you're, you're postulating and just write down the best, the, you know, you, you pick your effect size and then just write a power calculation and see what the sample size of a study would be to find that effect size. And when you get a sample size of 4.8 million in each arm, you gotta let go, you gotta let go of what you're doing. Um, yeah. And so, I mean, I think, yeah, that was, but here's what I'll say about Emily Oster's points that I thought was interesting. Um, yes, the analogy. Would I have said the analogy? No, uh, but you know, she said the analogy. I think her analogy is interesting in a couple of ways. In one respect, if you think about the individual risk, there is some truth to her analogy, which was that your vaccinated grandmother may have some non-zero risk of something bad happening to her, but after vaccination is super low. And the kids actually naturally have a super low risk of something really bad happening to them. And so I think that part of the analogy is, is pretty solid. Then the next part of the analogy is the transmission part. Yeah. which is your vaccinated grandmother has almost a near zero risk of ever right. spreading this to someone. Right. What about kids? Yeah. And the answer is, I actually think um, it depends on the population spread. Mm-hmm. And in and, 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 and Emily Oster's hypothetical world of the summer when everyone's been vaccinated, maybe we look like Israel and the cases yeah. are bottomed out and maybe her analogy is actually true, but maybe the cases are higher and her analogy doesn't hold. So I thought, you know, and then I'll say that, you know, you're, you're a good person because a good person actually, you know, 
read her follow-up thread where she acknowledges, um, you know, the fact that she might have put things differently, and and a good person says, that's good of you to show that you are willing to consider criticism even when it's pointed. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> I'm not a good person, uh, and so I would never have apologized. And 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 actually, I think we live in a world. I hate to say it, where you, you the these animals on Twitter you can't you can never show weakness you can it's like it's like prison Paul it's yeah. like prison you can never apologize you can never show any weakness I, and, and I, that's sad that's sad yeah well what well, I my strategy is either to step away for a while or to mute people who yes. are don't because there's there are people who hate, kind of hate what I stand for or what I say that's and impossible but yeah okay it's true you know and so, so anyway that that's that's <clears throat> The nature, the, you know, bas basically that's my strategy. Because I, as I have alluded to, I have learned a tremendous amount from Twitter. Uh, I tried to explain this actually to our our current chief of medicine, who doesn't buy it at all. But but you know, I learned I've learned from people in infectious disease and outside areas, and you know, I've I've learned from you. I've learned. I I think uh, Zainab Tufekshi has is a brilliant thinker in this area, and she was studying pandemics before there was a pandemic. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I, I just think it's it's great to, to expose yourself. And Emily Oster is really thoughtful. Um, I think one thing that's been very interesting also is I, I don't really know Bob Wachter at all, right? Um, and he has been summarizing you know, the UCSF experience on Twitter from the beginning. Even though I don't think of him as a COVID-19 expert, it's just interesting to hear how a city very much like Boston responded differently yeah. and got, you know, I, obviously you had cases, but yeah. but why is it that, bad, the, yeah. that the Bay Area just never really got slammed the way yeah. other California cities did? Yeah. Like you know, and it's, so it's not just climate, it's not just yeah. the state of California, you know, what's your hypothesis? It's fascinating. <laughs> That's the one thing that, uh, I keep out of trouble by not hype. I mean, um, okay. <laughs> no, no. I mean, you. Uh, 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 Ten weeks ago, everyone had hypotheses about India. Now look at them now. But oh, I know, I know, I know, I know. So, so I'm. Uh, all I can tell you is, so he would he would write these summaries, yeah. and I think, wait a second, there are fewer people with COVID in all of the, you know, UCSF hospitals than in one of our community hospitals. Yes, yes. You know, that's amazing. Yes. You know? I guess I would say, I mean, the the only differences that I can come up with, um, of course, everyone would like to say great leadership. No, it's the only difference <laughs> I can think of. I mean, um, this is a city or this is a region of the country where um, uh, the I, I don't know the answer. Maybe someday we'll find out. But the fraction of people who can completely remove themselves from contact through telework, um, it may be, it may be the highest of any place. I mean, a whole city predicated on the technology and information. Yeah. Um, Fascinating. Yeah, and, I've heard the, that. Yeah. I've heard that, but there, but you know, when you go to San Francisco, there are a lot of poor people. They are, yeah, I know. So, I see many on my walks around. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, what's going on? I don't yeah, have a good answer. You know, I mean, part of it could just be exponential spread didn't get a chance to take off yet, and never did, and and maybe that's what happened in India. I mean, I I I I think it's you know, I read, I decided this weekend to read the New Yorker piece from February on how India escaped COVID nineteen by Muk by Mukherjee. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I just read it just to see, you know, what did he say? Did they did they really think? <laughs> well, they had all, they had these hypotheses. Yeah, uh, so many. younger younger yeah. age age structure. Uh, yeah, um, more uh, a sort of uh, the, the the one that I think is probably the, the the weakest hypothesis is that there's so much exposure to other antigens. Ah, uh, right, cross reactivity, which yeah. we know is likely not very good at all in this yeah at all. Yeah, no, no. no, it's not going to do it for you. Cross reactivity didn't not going to save you. Yeah, no, not for a new human pathogen. Yeah, uh, you know, it was. It's just it was. It was fascinating to read because it was not published that long ago. It no, was and is profoundly so inaccurate. No, it's, it's probably wrong. But yeah, um, but you know what I think, Paul. I mean, if I were to look at it broadly, um, I think that, um, and I know our time's up, stuff, so we got to go. But, but um, I think that um, that it, it, you know. Um, First of all, I, I would just concede that I don't think there's any single person who has a theory or model that actually explained everything that happened to every no. person. Yeah, right. So they're all they're all partial, incomplete. 
Um, I, and I always put it in a few buckets. I mean, I think one thing that we don't talk too much about is the seed load. So, you know, we all got concerned roughly middle of March, March 10th ish, you know, in 2020. Yeah. And at that moment, if you just, you know, just dropped the iron walls and separated the world, there was some seed load in every different nation. I don't know what that seed load was. It's not measurable. We certainly didn't measure it. Um, when you have a different seed load, um, and then you insert on top of that um, an exponential growth combined with stochasticity and chaos where some yep. paths will die, um, different seed loads can have very different conditions um, just by where you were. Then yep. the next thing I think human interventions like a lockdown, I don't know if lockdowns work or don't work. I actually really don't know. But I, I, but I wonder if one of the effect modifiers is the number of cases per 100,000 people. So maybe if there's seven per 100,000, you lock everyone down, the little interactions you're going to get It'll, the virus will die out. But maybe if there's 700 or 7,000 in 100,000, you lock it down. The little interactions are enough to propagate spread. I don't yes. know the answer. Yeah, I mean, those, those, those would, you know, this, this over dispersion phenomenon yes. in, in uh, SARS-CoV-2 plays a role because that all it takes is, you know, we had the Biogen conference. Yes, in, yes, in, oh, like, yes. You know, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, Super spreader Biogen. Exactly. You know, it, it, it's, it's amazing. Without that conference, might we have been more right. like the Bay Area, because yeah. we have a lot of tech people who could work from home too. You know? yeah. So, yeah, that's another yeah. point. Yeah, how, how much um, things depend on uh, these sort of random moves. Yes. And yes. then the other things I'd put is, I mean, I do think maybe there are differences in in people, population structures, but also obedience. You know, yeah. Australians, they follow rules better than, the, we don't, we are Americans, man. I grew up in Indiana. We don't follow <laughs> rules. And uh, you tell me what to do, I tell you to go, I tell you where you can take your rule. Um, I think I think maybe there is some element to climate seasonality, but as you say, you know, it's maybe some partial element. And then, um, I don't know, I think time will tell. Um, and, and randomness, of course, the hardest yeah. thing to grapple with. Okay, the last thing I wanna talk about before we go, yeah. um, because it's a positive topic, or at least it'll make us laugh. Um, the, pay, the thing that you and I have always agreed on, which is they invite you to give a lecture, Paul. They pay you nothing for it. They know you're a, a, a fabulously wealthy infectious disease doctor. <laughs> and then they ask you to do all this paperwork before. How yeah. much paperwork? And what is going, and let me see your slides. Send them to me two months before. Um, <laughs> fill out these forms. Can we record? Can you do this? Can you do that? Oh God, I can't. It's unbelievable. It. Yeah. I mean, the, the thing that, one of the first things of yours that I ever read, unfortunately, I think you deleted it. Was... Well, I del I had said an, a program deleted all my tweets prior to a certain year, but yeah, you know, it, it was it was it was brilliant. It was kind of a response to each of these requests when you get invited to give a talk. And you know, the most absurd one recently that I experienced was in addition to all the paperwork was that you were supposed to uh, download a special program <laughs> onto your computer. Yeah that you could join the conference using that proprietary program and also have a training session ahead of time to learn how to use it. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh. I mean, so I think that if you're gonna have a conference, first, you know, it's great, it's great that you get the op you, know, you get people the opportunity to speak, but make it as easy as possible for your speakers. I think that's kind of the lesson. I, I I'm, I'm with you. I, I've had to do the, the pre-Zoom training session my yeah. head is, exp uh, I get so angry. Yeah. I mean, I mean uh, Zoom fortunately is quite easy to use, but but the the proprietary software that you have to download so that you can then join the conference virtually is like taking it a little far. And then as soon as it downloads, it's like, do you agree to share all your photographs? With? I was like, no, what do you want? Wait, share all my photographs with your software? Get the fuck out of here. Yeah. I was like, and then what I want, do they want? What, what happens to all that paperwork that gets filled out? I don't know. Where does it go? And the other thing, of course, is these days there is really no paperwork. It's all yes, done it's all electronically. And, but a lot of the forms are still in the form a PDF of faxes. They're yeah. PDFs that you cannot modify. Yeah. No, you have yeah. to print it and sign it and then scan it. Oh my God. Right. I don't know what what are they thinking? And 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 all of this is done, I think, out of the sake of eliminating bias, which they haven't touched. I mean, if, as frankly, I'm looking, they haven't touched the bias. I mean, when yeah. it exists, it exists, and some people have less of it. I mean, that's the issue. Yeah, I, I wrote something once uh, in, my, in my New England Journal Medicine Journal Watch thing about uh, being asked to provide learning objectives. And then I, I put parenthetically in afterwards, has there ever been a time when learning objectives actually led to more learning. <laughs> I don't think that they ever have. <laughs> no. You know what I think? I mean, this is my my terrible idea, which is like, um, you know, 
uh, we both probably teach in medical schools and, and, yeah. uh, you know, and, and I think that uh, to be perfectly honest, I'm, I'm confident and I've experienced that not everyone is, a, is meant to be up there teaching. And there's sometimes you go there and you're like, oh boy, when is this going to be over? And then when they go like one minute over, you feel the pang of anxiety in your heart, like someone stabbed you. Um, and so what I think is a lot of schools made well-intentioned efforts that, you know, well, you know, not everyone's doing a good job teaching. So let's introduce some things to get everyone up to the same level. And so they introduce things like, you know, submit your teaching objectives and have certain yeah. slides and we want to review it and make sure not busy and all these things. And what they realize, and what I, I think the missing point is that they've inserted all this bureaucracy that didn't actually, doesn't actually get rid of the problem, which is the problem is that some people are gifted at it and some people are not gifted at it. And, and, yeah. and then unless you want to throw someone's ass out, which nobody <laughs> wants to do, you're not going to get it better. I think that's, uh, yeah, it's true. <laughs> I, 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 you know, I, I just, I just know that, that, that when they, you know, three learning objectives and five ABIM style questions, you know, for pre and post test <laughs> assessment of learning. It's, it's like my heart sinks. My heart so. sinks, you know, and um, I don't know if I could do it perfectly. Here's my, my rules of um, lecturing. You know, I like for one, I actually, I, I, when somebody asked me to give a lecture to a class, I, I see it as an opportunity. It's an opportunity yeah, to indoctrinate. I mean, teach them what I think. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then my view is if you want to be in the room, I pray, I ask you, you know, don't look at your phone, don't go on your computer, don't do anything, don't take notes. There's nothing I say that's so important. You need to write anything down. You're going to remember what the high points are. In contrast, I'm happy to say that if at any moment of this talk, I bore you, you should just walk right out of there. And, and that's the transaction I want. Instead, what we have is they'll never leave, but they're not listening. And I was yeah. like, that I don't want. I would rather let you go. You, if I suck, walk out, you know? There's, there's one teaching room at Harvard Medical School that has more screens in it than human beings. <laughs> so, you know, the, 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 the students come in, all of them have their laptop and phone. Yeah. And then there are screens absolutely everywhere. And you know, the idea that you are gonna command their attention in a room like that is insane. I mean, there's just so much distraction. So anyway, kind of fun. It's kind of fun, but um, I will say one last thing. Um, but the best moments in my education was always those few times where the person up there, they knew what they were doing and they did a damn good job. And, and oh, that, you never forget, you'll never forget those. Problems. Totally agree, um, it's very, agree. Yeah, it's inspiring. It's inspiring. Paul Sachs, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for taking, uh, I took a lot of your time up. Uh, thank you so much. We will post this on YouTube. We'll post it on the podcast. Um, you know, I, uh, I, I agree with every, all the kind words I've heard about you. And I think you're the perfect person to follow. Paul Sachs, MD, you're on Twitter. Thanks so much for doing this. <laughs> Thanks, Vinay. Really appreciate it.